So hello again. I am Kevin Pugh. I'm Cassie Bergstrom. Welcome back. <laughs> and this is another one of our motivation vlogs. So for this one, we are going to talk about transformative experience theory, which probably you haven't heard of because it's more of a theory that my colleagues and I have developed and it's obviously not, a, not as popular as like the main theories like self-determination theory and mindset theory and all that, but you know. So we, what we thought we would do today is um, kind of do as an interview format since this is, you know, sort of a theory my colleagues and I have developed. So Cassie's gonna ask questions. I'll do yep. my best to respond and that will be today's thing. Oh, but first, okay, so we have yes. new backgrounds. You can try and guess where we are. Mm. Mine doesn't pick up my my blanket behind there. Yes, <laughs> there's our backgrounds. <laughs> so, Kevin, what is a transformative experience? All right. So, let me give an example. So, um, back once I was teaching like sixth grade science, a unit on um, physics, so Newton's laws, and, and there's one student who I'll call Ed. Um, and for him, so, so learning about Newton's laws was, wasn't just a school thing, mm -hmm. but it was this exciting new way to see the world. So he started seeing Newton's laws and inertia and things everywhere. Like you drive in the car, they would turn, inertia, uh, watch a movie, you know, things would blow up and fall down and, you know, think about forces and that and then the best example so um he shared this example that his niece came over and was running around the house and went <laughs> running through the kitchen in her socks on the slick hardwood fault floor and tried to stop but couldn't stop and slid and crashed into the door so ed was like oh, you know inertia a child in motion will continue in motion until acted upon by the door. <laughs> you know, and he thought this was awesome. You know, he could see the whole event in terms of news laws. I'm not sure how thrilled the, the niece was about this, but Ed thought it was great. Um, so this is an example of a transformative experience when a student uh, takes his or her learning and uses it in his or her everyday life to see and experience the world in a meaningful new way. Um, and that's, that's the basic definition of a transformative experience. Awesome. So where did transformative experience theory come from? And could you explain a little more about that? Sure, yeah. So um, back, boy, this would be like 20, 25 years ago, when I was um, in grad school, uh, then there was a, a group of us. So um, a couple of professors, David Wong, Dick Prawat, um, a couple other doc students. And we kind of formed a, a, a Dewey group. So, so John Dewey was a great American educator and philosopher and an all around great thinker. Um, and we were really intrigued by his ideas, particularly his ideas about aesthetic experience. He wrote one book about aesthetics and about what aesthetic experience is, which um, was kind of his way of trying to get out what is, what, what is kind of optimal experience, like how you define it and um, that. And so we were, were studying that and we were also, most of us, you know, had some sort of science background. We're interested in, in science education and that. And, and we're doing a lot of thinking of uh, along the lines of what would it mean to take Dewey's ideas of aesthetics and aesthetic experience. And, and he has a larger theory of, of, of experience and apply that to science education. What would it look like and that? And that's really where it came from. So, so there's a number of characteristics of aesthetic experience. There's um, things like, you know, a unity to experience and it enfolds, doesn't just end, but it ends in a consummation or a completeness and all this stuff. But, but a real defining quality is also this transformation of um, perception. So mm -hmm. a lot of art-based experience, really meaningful ones are ones in which um, art, you know, either you know, visual art or like the theater or 
a movie or a book or whatever, you know, they lead us to see and experience the world in, in some new profound way. And so we, we kind of took those things, uh, those qualities and began using it to conceptualize science education and what, what the outcomes of science education should be about and what it should look like. And, and out of that is where, you know, this term transformative experience came from and, uh, and the theory out of that. Gotcha. So, so that's more the theoretical basis of it. Um, how do you research transformative experience? Yeah, not easy. <laughs> no, because <laughs> we're rarely there when it happens. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, we, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, like, how would you you measure or recognize or study this? And so, you know, we ended up defining transformative experience in terms of certain characteristics that we could use for a, a more measurable definition of transformative experience. Um, and so there's three. Um, motivated use, uh, which is applying the content in some you know, context where you don't have to. Expansion of perception, coming to see the world through the lens of the, the content you're learning. Um, and experiential value, you know, valuing the content for the way it enriches experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess I should clarify that even though you know, this is kind of developed in the context of science education and mm -hmm. most of the research we did there, um, it's certainly not exclusive to science education that these characteristics, motivated use, expansion of perception, experience about, they could apply to any learning in any context. Um, and you know the story I sh shared of Ed is a good example of that. So, um, you know, he was applying Newton's laws just on his own in his everyday context. You know, it wasn't an assignment. I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. You know, telling him, okay, you need to think about your niece and analyze it in terms of Newton laws. It was just something he was choosing to do. So that's motivated use. And then expansion of perception. You know, is seeing the world through Newton's laws. And so, you, you know, by choosing to use those ideas, then it expanded his perception. He's able to see something like his new niece crashing into the door, you know, in a, in a new way that had meaning to him. Again, probably not so much the niece, but, um, <laughs> and then experiential value um, is again, you know, so he came to value Newton's laws um, for the way that they enriched his experience. And he was, you know, explicit about this, you know, and talked about like, yeah, you know, they're worth learning, not just because I want to pass and, you know, go into seventh, but because they allow me to like see the world in a new way. And, and that, you know, so, um, you know, he valued the content for the way it enriched his experience. Um, and he also came to take more interest in, you know, certain events and things in the world, like, his niece crashing into the door or a drive in the car and you know which is also experiential value you know that you know because you can see these events or objects in the world um through the lens of the content then, then those objects and events become more meaningful um so those are the characteristics we kind of use to define transformative experience and then and based on those we've developed a measure of transformative experience so so we actually have a survey measure that we can use um, to assess levels of transformative experience. Um, sometimes we use them, uh, but more in like an interview format. So we'll do more in-depth interviews um, to try to, you know, get at um, how prevalent these qualities are in students' experience and so on. All right, thank you. So both quantitative and qualitative measures, we see. <laughs> yep, yep. They can get it, get at that same, uh, help us answer more about this and learn more about it. Um, so a couple of related things here. Um, so does it really matter if students have transformative experiences? I guess that's, I mean, I'm sold. So but from a perspective <laughs> of someone who might not be as familiar or maybe a little critical of, of whether um, this is something they should devote time to, does it matter? Um, do students have to apply their learning in their everyday lives? And isn't it just enough if they learn content? Yeah, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we I mean, can move on. That's my perspective, but I understand, you, you know, um, that obviously, you know, teachers are in a lot of pressure, you know, to focus on sort of, sort of like measurable learning outcome, you know, you know, like I need to show that they have learned this content 
whether they applied in their lives is, um, you know, not the thing that they're held accountable for and assessments and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so, so I understand all this, um, but really from my perspective, it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of a true doing at heart. So, so do you believe that life was about undergoing meaningful experiences and increasing our capacity for meaningful experience. And hence, you know, the goal of education should be to provide students with meaningful experience and to increase their capacity for meaningful whole experience. So I mean, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, that's what life's about. So that's what education should be about. You know, it should be, you know, helping students, you know, undergo these transformative experiences and prepare them to uh, have more transformative experiences in the future that, that really, you know, education should be about enriching and expanding uh, their lives, making it better. So um, that said, um, there are also practical benefits for undergoing transformative experience. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that we, we've done quite a bit of research and, and um, consistently found that students who undergo deeper levels of transformative experience that um, you know compared to students who don't they're more likely to demonstrate enduring learning so if mm -hmm. you follow up assessments later they maintain their, their level of understanding instead of reverting to prior understandings uh, similarly they're more likely to undergo conceptual change which means overcome existing misconceptions and not revert back to those misconceptions later on um, they're more likely to be able to apply their learning um, in real world sen settings when asked to. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, if you have application kinds of questions on a test or whatever, students who have had transformative experiences, you know, on their own, they realize are more likely to be successful on those. Um, and then there's other, um, you, you know, kind of useful benefits in that transformative experiences lead to interest in a domain and, um, uh, you know, like an inclination to major in college or pursue a career in that domain. So like in some of this um, recent research we did that we found that even controlling for students' initial interest, um, mm -hmm. and this was in geoscience, this is at the university level, um, mm -hmm. students who reported, you know, higher levels of transformative experience during the semester, you know, then later reported higher levels of confidence in their major and inclination to um, pursue a career in that major, um, which you know, in the sciences, in STEM generally, this is kind of a big thing because um, we're always trying to get more people to go into STEM careers. So it seems like transformative experiences is one way to um, <clears throat> help get more people into STEM. So. Yeah, and all great beneficial outcomes that we tend mm -hmm. to see co-occurring with TE here. Mm -hmm. TE being transformative experience. I'm, <laughs> sure that's, I'm not throwing around the acronyms without explaining, uh, explaining there. So, you know, this sounds wonderful and awesome, but how common is this? How common is it that we actually see students have transformative experience? Yeah, so you know that Las Vegas slogan <laughs> what happens here stays here that like yes. that that slogan applies way too well to classrooms in the, the sense that the learning that happens in the classroom stays in the classroom mm -hmm. and it doesn't go anywhere that for the most part you know the learning just isn't transformative um students don't you know think about it outside of class they don't act on it outside of class and, um, you, you know, obviously we, you know, we, we haven't, we, we don't have a huge um, survey sample of this. So I can, can, you know, really only speak from uh, a more limited perspective and more so in science. But in, in our research, it tends to be that, you know, it's maybe like about 10% of the students who kind of like just naturally have transformative experience. Um, and then maybe another, I don't know, 20, 25 percent students who might have, you know, some qualities and characteristics of transformative experience, but 
um, not really like a full transformative experience. So um, yeah, not, not very common. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, <laughs> not very common. <laughs> and so what can we do if, they, if they're not very common? You know, what could teachers do um, to help increase the likelihood their students might have these beneficial experiences? So I, this is some of the research we've really worked on. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been quite a few studies where we focus on trying to identify um, strategies and pedagogies that um, help foster transformative experiences. And the good news is, is that you can. I mean, don't expect that all your students are going to have transformative experience, but it seems more like, you know, when um, you implement, you know, teaching for transformative experience strategies, then it can go from like, you know, 10% more up to like a third of the class with, you know, half or more, at least having, you know, some degree of transformative experience and that. So, um, you know, out of that research, we've um, put together a model of, of teaching for transformative experiences. Um, and, and we call this, uh, you know, model teaching for transformative experiences in science, because most of them done in science. But again, like I said, you know, th this applies generally. Um, recently, I, I tried putting this all together um, and, and in fact, published a book on, on teaching for transformative experiences. I have one. You have your book? <laughs> yeah. I feel like what the, you know, the, uh, my, what do they call that? The shameless self-promotion. <laughs> I was gonna say an infomercial? <laughs> no. here, here, here's my shameless, my shameless self-promotion. So yes, there's a book. Oh, oh look, and, and Zoom doesn't- Now you can't see the background. <laughs> Put it in front of, no, that didn't work either, dang. <laughs> Your shameless self-promotion went well, yes. <laughs> can include Obviously the link Zoom in. was working against me. What's up with that? Include the link in the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, um, you know, so when I wrote this book, I, I, I tried to you know, kind of synthesize what's there and put together really three major design principles. So one of the strategies is this um, artistic selection and crafting of content. So mm -hmm. just like artists uh, are thoughtful and deliberate about what they select to put in a composition and how they craft it together. Teachers can be very deliberate about selecting content worth teaching and crafting it together in compelling ways. Um, and um, one way we're talking about, you know, is uh, they can craft ideas. So do we um, distinguish between concepts and ideas, whereas ideas are are possibilities, concepts are accepted meanings. Uh -huh. And you know, one of our roles as teachers is to try to take concepts and craft them into ideas. <laughs> yeah, so could you give some examples of what it means to artistically craft content as ideas? Yes, so um, one of my favorite movies is Dead Poet Society. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I think it has a good example of this kind of artistic crafting of content. It always makes me think, yeah, you know, we should hire Hollywood script writers to help us write curriculum. <laughs> it so well. um, but, you know, in, in this movie, there's a, you know, a high school, uh, here's a English literature teacher. Um, and, uh, you know, he gets up in front of his class and instead of saying, okay, we're going to learn about this and this, and these are our objectives that, no, no, he gives up and says things like, no matter what anyone tells you, words and ideas can change the world. <laughs> uh, and we don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race and the human race is filled with passion. And yes. so, uh, <laughs> You, you know, what, what it does is it creates anticipation. So, so at the core of crafting content is, is to try to craft it in a way where it creates anticipation about acting on the content. Mm -hmm. This is what Mr. Keating does. You know, he creates anticipation about, 
you know, words and ideas and poetry and literature, um, and, you know, that gets the students to actually go and act on and try out those things. Um, another good example, uh, you know, from science comes from Walter Lewin. So he was like a famous professor at MIT mm -hmm. and um, gave these great lectures. And, and part of what's so great about him was like, he was just really good at creating anticipation in the same sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, like I wrote down one of his quotes. Um, so this is when he's, he's teaching about Snell's law, which has to do with refraction and things like that. But instead of framing his lesson as, okay, we're gonna learn about Snell's law and we're gonna learn about refraction and stuff. No, he starts out his lecture by, all of you have looked at rainbows, but very few of you have ever seen one. Seeing is different than looking. Today we are going to see a rainbow. Your life will never be the same. Because of your knowledge, you'll be able to see way more than just the beauty of the bows that everyone else can see. Like that is yeah. artistic crafting of content. It creates anticipation, gets yeah. you thinking about seeing the world in some different way. And um, so, yeah, that's um, one aspect. Another is um, this idea of framing the content in terms of having the journey. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, which, which is also about creating anticipation too, obviously. Um, but this kind of comes from, so Dewey had a metaphor in which he compared the curriculum to a map. Mm -hmm. And um, he said that the, you, you know, map is, is great. You know, it can guide your journey and so on, but it shouldn't be a substitute for a personal experience in your personal journey. Um, and um, by that, he meant that the, the curriculum that we have is, you know, those ideas in there, that they're great. Um, and they, um, but they shouldn't be, but just learning those ideas shouldn't be a substitute for using those ideas to see and experience the world in a different way. Um, the, you know, learning about science and, and, you know, learning the science concepts and memorizing the Krebs cycle and all that, that shouldn't be a substitute for using those ideas to see and experience the world. Like the real value, just like the real value in a map is, is not just looking at the map, but using it to go and have your mm -hmm. own journey. Um, that we should frame education the same way, that the real value of, of science isn't just learning those science ideas, the real value of math isn't just doing those equations and um, the real value of, of history isn't just learning those events, but in being able to use that content to experience the world in a new way, to have your own mm -hmm. journey. And so to convey that to your students, you know, that's another way of, of this artistic framing of the content. Awesome. Great examples. So that that was the first design principle is this artistically crafting content as ideas. Um, so what's the next design principle? So the next one is um, what I refer to as an experiential apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. um, and so so an apprenticeship, if, if you think about what an apprenticeship is, you know, like if you go back in time and you were going to be a blacksmith, or I guess today, even if you're going to be a blacksmith, you know, you do a apprenticeship. Yeah. And, um, you know, the key characteristics of that kind of learning model is it's based on modeling and scaffolding. Um, so, you know, there's some uh, more experienced person, some master who models the correct thing, you know, and then the apprentice, uh, you know, takes on some responsibility in the master, you know, scaffolds the individual they go along. Well, it turns out, you know, those, those principles of modeling and scaffolding can really apply to experience and to transformative experience as well. Um, so, you know, other ways to, to, to foster transformative experiences is, is one to model those experiences yourself, mm -hmm. uh, to talk about, you know, how you see and experience the world and find value in it by seeing it through the lens of particular content. So, you know, it was like I had one geology professor. Um, so I um, took intro geology as like a freshman in um, college. 
first geology class. And he was just like so passionate about it. You could tell he just lived geology. Like, you know, come in and you have new pictures uh, uh -huh. to show us. Um, and this was, you know, actual slides. So we put them in a slide. I don't know this focus on pictures at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> show him up there and it's always like, okay. So the other day I was driving and I passed this road cut, you know, where the road <laughs> is cut through. Mm -hmm. And I saw these and I just had to stop and get this picture and, you know, I was mad because we were late for something, but I just couldn't drive by. You know, it's like, wow, <laughs> like I've never thought to look at a road cut before. And here, those of you know, or some picture out of an airplane, I had to crawl across some old lady to get this picture. But look, it's a perfect anticline in this series of anticline and synclines. Isn't that great? You know, it's like, wow. And it's like, I'd leave that class and, and I like, I couldn't help but start to see the world in terms of geology, you know, so that, you know, that modeling of the, of the passion and of your own transformative experiences um, is one way. Um, but then uh, scaffolding is needed too. Um, so, so scaffolding is, is supporting students in being able to do that re-seeing. Um, and but, and by, by re-seeing, that means, you know, like coming to see the world um, and some aspect of it in a new way by seeing it through the lens of the content. So that modeling and, and scaffolding are, are characteristics of this experiential apprenticeship. Yeah, can you give some examples of what it means to scaffold reseeing? Yeah, good, good point. So, um, so we did one um, research study with a um, sixth grade middle school science teacher, so it was earth science. Mm -hmm. um, again, one of my favorites. Um, and this was during a, a, a weather unit. So they were learning about things like air pressure and heat transfer and, and then just the causes of weather in general. Um, and so in, in order to help scaffold the students experience. So he did some of this modeling, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about uh, you know, his own experiences of, of seeing the world in terms of air pressure and, um, and, and weather and that. Um, but then, but it's, it, it's actually a really difficult thing to be able to apply learning in your everyday life. And so it takes a number of supports. So, so one support is, is to just help students recognize opportunities um, mm -hmm. to find the content. So um, <clears throat> he would, um, help the students identify a number of opportunities where they might be able to think about things like air pressure. Um, and so hold like a class brainstorming session about this, mm -hmm. um, where the students would think up opportunities they have, and then he would bring up, you know, a number of other interesting opportunities they might have to think about air pressure. Um, and then a the second one, you know, is allow the students to share these re-seen experiences. So then he would gather the students together um, they called this carpet time because he had a carpet that they could gather around on and they could share some experiences like, oh yeah, so I was driving up the canyon and my ears uh, were, were, were popping and this whatever and I thought about air pressure and we were like, great. And then the teacher could, you know, press the students to try to think about these examples in, in a bit deeper level. Mm -hmm. um, because often, you know, they would just think of it, but not in much depth. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was skiing and there was air pressure. Uh, my, my, my soda has air pressure in it or something like that. Um, or when they talked about weather, so he, he, you know, he had the students all share their own wild weather experiences. And they were mm -hmm. trying to, okay, so now I want you to think about these weather experiences in terms of the science ideas. But they were always so excited and like the story of the trampoline blowing over the fence uh, through his heart. So, they, so you do some scaffolding of their their experience there. But then in addition, um, we, we came to this idea of creating case studies out of the students' experiences. So mm -hmm. like uh, these weather experiences, we took common ones. So everyone who talked about being in a hailstorm, and put them together in one case st study and then had the students go and analyze their own experiences, which is similar to what you had been doing. Like there mm -hmm. was a workbook it would, you know, with case studies, but it was of things like the Santa Ana winds and I don't know, the students didn't care about the Santa Ana winds, but when it came to their wind, you yeah. know, their hellstorm, 
uh, then uh, you know kind of made all the difference. And and by um, going through a, a sort of a detailed process of analyzing their experience, they really came to see these experiences at a deeper level. Um, so those are would, would be examples of this scaffolding re-seeing, you know, was helping students to, to find opportunities, to share opportunities, and then to look at them at a deeper level. <clears throat> awesome. All right, so we've covered two of the, the design principles. What is the third design principle? Well, the third one I refer to as doing and undergoing. And mm -hmm. this comes from Dewey that, that you know, as I do is that aesthetic experience requires both doing and undergoing. Doing is, is kind of straightforward. Mm -hmm. and, and what we often think of, you know, that students often learn really well when they get to actually engage in doing something. Um, so, um, and it's, you know, part of that metaphor of don't let the map substitute for the experience. Yeah. So, so part of the meaning of that metaphor is also relates to this kind of doing. So don't let learning about science substitute for actually doing science. Don't let learning about literature substitute for actually doing literature um, and so on that, that puts students in the role of explore, you know, so, so when you think of a map, originally there were some explorers. Yeah. Um, like Lewis and Clark, they went out and out of their experience, they were able to put together a map that then people can use uh, for their um, own journeys. It can be a guide. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, students shouldn't just be in the role of being map readers, you know, just learning about the curriculum, but, you know, allow them to use that curriculum to go and, you know, have their own experiences, have their own journey. Um, yeah. so, that, so that's the doing. Um, and, I, you know, I think today, you know, everyone, you know, kind of focuses on this. Yes, we, we need to engage our students in sort of these active learning opportunities. But undergoing is kind of a new idea. So this means like surrendering to the experience. So mm -hmm. again, you know, to have a, an aesthetic experience, you have to surrender to it. Um, I like to use the example of going to the movies. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I have great kids, love my kids. They're not always the best movie wa watching companions because they love to criticize the movie as we watch it. <laughs> uh huh because they've usually like read the book, you know, and things like that. It's like, oh, they left out this or they don't have this character, you know, like, but those things like pull you out of the moment and are kind of the opposite of surrendering to the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and to be transformed by a movie, you know, you have to like set all those criticisms aside and surrender to the experience. Um, and so same with, you know, transformative experience in education. Students have to be willing to undergo the set aside you know their 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 concerns and things about like am i doing this right am i getting an a do people think i'm a nerd what do i look like uh mm -hmm. and and surrender to the learning experience to undergo um and the key to that is is, is really the the motivation principles that we've talked about in this other blog mm -hmm. that, you know it's it's creating a a context and a culture where still students can feel safe to surrender. So that involves mm -hmm. things like creating a mastery goal environment mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a performance goal environment. Mm -hmm. um, creating an environment in which students um, needs for autonomy, competence and relatedness are met. Um, and so, yeah, all that other stuff, you know, it's like that motivation stuff that we've talked about is, is really kind of a necessary base level mm -hmm. for transformative learning to happen. So students can feel free to undergo. Nice. All right. So with all of this, and if we start, you know, if we as teachers start doing this in our classrooms and trying to encourage this scaffolding we're seeing, we're modeling things, you know, encouraging that doing and undergoing. How can teachers know if they are fostering transformative experiences? So um, it's a good question. So sometimes we have a sense of this as, as, as teachers, we can try to pay attention or simply talk, you know, you know to our students, um, try to figure that out, but, it, but it's hard. And, and so, um, you know, we actually developed a, a teacher-friendly measure of transformative experience. So I include in my book, again, 
shameless self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, you don't need to get the book. Uh, you know, I just made available on the um, website I have. I can put the, the link in. Um, but we did create, a, you know, a teacher-friendly version that teachers could use um, along with instructions how to use it. And so you can, you know, assess your class and, and um, sort of see what levels, you know, where they are in terms of levels of transformative experience. And yeah. Um, Excellent. And yeah. I think always asking students is helpful as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in addition to a survey, um, you know, you can have them even write about these things, possibly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lots of things. Awesome. Thank you for sharing so much about transformative experience theory um, and walking through the different principles and different ways that we can encourage um, teachers to try this out in their classes. So do you want to do the grand reveal of where we are today? Okay. Where are you, Cassie? <laughs> where am I? So I am, it was, this was middle of the winter a few years ago. We did a night hike up to Brainerd Lake and that's Mount Audubon there in the back. Oh. So Indian Peaks Wilderness Area in Colorado. God, I, knew, I, yes. I knew the cold was coming, so I was like, I might as well prepare. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? So mine is, so it's kind of a purposes one. So, so mine is, you know, a real distinctive place, which is, this is down in Arches National Park in uh, Southern Utah, mm -hmm. with the LaSalle Mountains in the background. Um, I chose this one because, you know, that geology professor I mentioned, mm -hmm. like I ended up actually majoring, I mean, minoring in geology and I nearly majored, um, and went into a career in geology all, all because of this one professor, uh -huh. but I, I always loved Arches National Park because it's so unique. And in this geology class, like I learned about, you know, the actual geology of it and, and oh, did a project nice. on it, um, and that. And it was like so fascinating because like now all these things, I mean, it's just a beautiful place. It is. But now it's like, now, like I know how these things form, where it came from. And oh, you know, there's like ancient seabeds stuff there. And then there's ancient sand dune stuff, you know, like over here and then, you know, and there's this cross bedding and, and I could see it all through the lens of jelly. And I still, like every time I go to Arches National Park, I'm, I'm still like just fascinated by the jail and it like it still enriches my experience because uh, I think it's just so cool. So very cool. <laughs> that's where I am. So it's a little it's been a lifelong the, the transport experience has lasted even to this day. Even to this day. Yes. <laughs> so wouldn't it be awesome if all our educators was like this, that it was transformative in the way that you know, throughout our students' lives, it was enriching them in some way. Maybe a small way, but in some way. I mean, that would, uh, I would just love to know that as a teacher. I would, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what yeah. you hope to hear. <laughs> yes, all the ways where maybe in some small way you're able to enrich and expand your students' everyday lives. So. All righty. Well, we will see you again uh, in the future. I think we have one more coming up. I think we have one more unit. Yep. All righty. We'll do that. We'll see you later. All right. Have a good week. Bye. <laughs> Bye.